Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Welcome back to Sunday Morning in the Old Cookbook Show. A couple of weeks ago, I did a recipe out of this Swan's Down uh, cake recipe book. And I referred to the Swan's Down cake manual and that Swan's Down isn't sold where I live in Canada, but that I could buy it from, you know, Amazon um, for $131 for a box of flour, which seemed ridiculous to me. So I didn't buy it. Um, and thank you to everyone who has now sent us boxes of Swan's Down uh, flour. Our uh, P.O. box is overflowing with flour. I have lots of Swan's Down to, uh, to play around with now. So I thought I'd revisit another cake recipe, um, this time from this cookbook called The Best Chocolate and Cocoa Recipes, put out by Walter Baker and Company Incorporated, which was at this point part of General Foods, um, same company that brought you Swans Down and all these other cookbooks. And so in this cookbook, all of the recipes use General Foods products. So it calls for Swans Down cake flour, it calls for Baker's Unsweetened Chocolate, Calumet baking powder, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, at this point, Baker's Chocolate is no longer part of General Foods. It seems to be part of Kraft at this point, Kraft Heinz, um, or at least here in Canada, it's part of Kraft Heinz. So we're going to get into this recipe. Um, starts out very basic in the traditional North American cake method. Going to cream together the butter and sugar. So while that's creaming together, we'll deal with the dry ingredients. I have the Swan's Down flour. I've already sifted it before measuring it. I've often said on the show that I no longer sift flour. And that is if it asks to be sifted after measuring. Um, if the recipe asks you to sift it before measuring, it's very important to sift it before measuring. The changes, it's because in North America we use volume. Um, if, if we used a scale and did things by weight, this would be a moot point. You wouldn't have to worry about it. But because we do it by volume, sifting it before measuring it gives the flour greater volume. And if it asks for that, the only way to get an accurate measurement is by sifting ahead of time. If it asks you to sift afterwards, I just don't do it anymore. So I've got the flour here. I'm gonna add baking soda and salt. Now it asks you to sift this three times. So I will do it because the recipe asks for it, um, but I'm doing it grudgingly. Okay, so one last thing about sifting flour and we'll move on. This recipe was written in what I consider to be the golden age of recipe writing. Um, especially in these, what I would call corporate cookbooks, um, where these giant food companies have, you know, laboratories staffed with recipe writers and home economists and food scientists designing and testing these recipes. And they're written out in a way that's very easy to understand. But there's a couple of points of language in these around sifting flour that I think a lot of people stumble on. And it has to do with a comma and where the comma appears. If, if the recipe calls for one cup of sifted flour, you sift the flour and then you measure it. If it asks for one cup of flour, comma, sifted, you measure the flour first and then you sift it. And that subtle use of language tells you um, the difference between the two. And the way recipes are written today, 2022, um, Recipes are written in a very sloppy manner today, I think. They're not tested the way they used to be. They're not vetted the way they used to be. There's no one editing the recipes the way they used to in this time period. So that was an egg I just added to the sugar and butter, and we're gonna cream that in. And I've made a mistake, but it'll be fine. So I added the soda in with the flour. I'm supposed to add the soda to the sour cream the sour cream would activate it and get it moving before we add it into the cake. But um, putting it all in is gonna be fine. It's, it's, it will make absolutely no difference in the end. I'm gonna deal with the chocolate next. So this recipe asks for two squares of Baker's unsweetened chocolate that I have to melt. And a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, we did a recipe that was brownies um, from the same time period asked for one and a half or two and a half squares of chocolate. And down in the comments section, a lot of people said, oh, I've got the wrong amount of chocolate because what's a square? 
and Baker's chocolate has changed the shape of their chocolate, which is true. Baker's has changed away from this square, and this square has always equaled one ounce of chocolate. One square equals one ounce, um, and it came in this shape, break down the middle, so each of these sides was a half ounce of chocolate. Um, it's still available in Canada in this form, but they have, and there were eight of these squares in a box for eight ounces total. But Baker's has switched their manufacturing to this new format, and when you open it up, there's two bars of chocolate inside. There's still eight ounces of chocolate in a box, same amount of chocolate in the box, but when you open up the bar, it's now this kind of chocolate bar shape, and each of these little rectangles is a quarter ounce, and it's marked right on it that it's a quarter ounce. So now it's this shape that is one square of chocolate to equal one ounce. And it sounds from the comment section like a lot of people got caught out by that and didn't realize what a square of chocolate, what the equivalent of a square of chocolate was or is. So when you see that in a recipe, it means one ounce by weight of chocolate. Um, and so you just have to use the appropriate amount. And you can use any kind of bar chocolate if you wanted to. So I'm gonna take these inside. I'm gonna melt them in the microwave and we'll move on with the recipe. Okay, so I, I melted the chocolate out of order from the recipe because I think it's, um, I think it's important if you are not a regular cake baker or you're not uh, someone who spends a lot of time in the kitchen, doing stuff in order can be overwhelming. And if you got all of the ingredients, the flour and the sour cream into here all mixed together and then went to melt the chocolate and, and do this next step, which is to mix in boiling water, something that um, I've always been told not to do. But anyway, we're going to do that. I, I think the batter would be in the mixer too long um, and that the soda would activate and your cake might not be as, uh, as good. So I think that doing it in this order, out of order, is probably best for most people. So there we go. Chocolate mixed with water, um, hot boiling water. Now, we are supposed to mix flour and sour cream into the butter sugar mixture. Um, half and half and half and half. So we'll turn this down and we'll mix in maybe three scoops of flour. Ah, it's going in nicely. Four scoops of flour. And then I'm supposed to put in a half a cup of sour cream. So, put that in first, and then we'll go back to the flour. And just mix it back and forth. Now, we mix in the chocolate hot water mixture. Now I have two nine inch round cake pans and I've made a parchment paper disc to put in the bottom of each. This has mixed enough. Now the oven is preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and we'll get these cakes in. I'm gonna divide the batter equally between the two, between the two cake pans. That's a really good looking cake batter. Um, I'm liking this, this is pretty good. Okay, so into the cake pan. And to everyone who asks, yes, the oven works. It is a working oven, it is hot. The sink works, the tap works, it all works. Okay, the cakes are baked. I'm gonna set them here, let them cool down to room temperature. You don't wanna put frosting on them until they've cooled at least to room temperature. And now it's time to make the frosting. And I have to admit that one of the reasons I wanted to make this recipe was to make the frosting because I've never made this kind of frosting before. And it's called the quick chocolate frosting. It tells you that this is the one that you should use. So it's four squares of Baker's unsweetened chocolate. Four ounces of chocolate, pretty easy. Then it says one and a quarter cups, 14 ounces of cold condensed milk. Condensed milk. Now condensed milk in Canada comes in a 300 milliliter can. 300 milliliter can, I have to assume, 1931, American cookbook using American measurements. Um, one and a quarter cups is 10 US fluid ounces. 300 milliliters is roughly 10 US fluid ounces. 
I have to assume that the 14 ounces that they're talking about is by weight. Into this pot over a low flame, I'm going to put a can of condensed milk. And yes, it is sweetened. Condensed milk is sweetened here in Canada and the United States. Now, four ounces of chocolate. I'm gonna put that in. I've got this over a low flame and we're just supposed to stir it until the chocolate melts into the condensed milk. And I'm supposed to stir it constantly until it's thickened. And I'm, I'm imagining in my brain something along the lines of a chocolate dulce de leche. Because we're going to be caramel, we're going to be driving off more of the water that's in the milk, in the, in the condensed milk, and caramelizing those sugars a little bit as we melt the chocolate in. And I've got some water standing by because it tells me to add a few drops at a time, if needed, um, to get a, a spreadable consistency. Now, it's starting to get thick. And the question that crosses my mind is why cook it thicker only to add water to thin it out? And I have to imagine that this is about developing flavor, um, caramelizing some of those sugars that are in the condensed milk. That's just a guess. Um, I haven't tasted it yet. I'm trying to resist. Oh, I can't resist. Okay, it's gonna be hot. Let's see. It's chocolatey, definitely chocolatey. I'm gonna cook a little bit further. There are some caramel notes coming through from that condensed milk. Now this is really thick and it is kind of spreadable. I'm gonna take it off the heat. I'm worried about it scorching. Now, this is spreadable. I'm gonna say that's spreadable. Doesn't say whether I should let it cool before I try to put it on the cake. I know you're supposed to let the cakes cool before you put frosting on them. Um, this doesn't say it, just says, makes enough frosting to cover tops of two nine inch layers. Thin with water a few drops at a time until the right consistency to spread. Um, I am gonna let that cool just a little bit before I start putting it on the cake. I'm not gonna put any water in. We'll see if that's a mistake in a moment. Yeah, okay, so that's good. Now, a little bit on the plate. Cake on top. So Glenn, it's great that uh, we f we tasted those things, but I, but I found this. When do we get to try this? Oh, Julie found the cake. Okay, so yes, let's have the cake now. Um, there's this back in here. I want to talk about the icing. In that case, I'll get a spoon. Um, so I've never made this icing before, and there was something about the icing that seemed vaguely familiar in the back of my brain. You may or may not know, I spent quite a bit of time on YouTube. <laughs> Um, um, and so there are a bunch of YouTube food channels that have outlandish, like clickbaity titles. Um, we added chocolate to condensed milk. You'll be amazed at what happened. Two ingredient, two minute chocolate fudge. Uh-huh. I was going to say, it's got a fudgy texture it's to it. It's that. It's, it's. All of the recipes are exactly that. And they've got, most of these videos have between 40 and 50 million views. So feel free to encourage 40 to 50 million people to stop by, and, stop check by out, and, check, and check out our cake video. Because <laughs> our two ingredient, two ingredient? Two ingredient fudge. Two minute fudge is gonna be it really goes good. With the cake. Goes with the cake. <laughs> okay, so there's the cake. Let me, get the, let me get the props. Well, there's more? Well. <laughs> oh, all the stuff. Hey, the stuff. you got some sundown flower. So swan, swan down sundown. Swan, swan down. <laughs> oh, swan's down flower. So we use the swan's down cake flour, which is 
ground apparently 27 times finer than any other all-purpose flour, which I don't know how that stacks up against other cake flours. There you go. Um, it's a pretty standard chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. It's got all the textures, it's got the flavors, it's not, it's not dried out, all the things it that you like about a chocolate cake. It is a standard chocolate cake. It doesn't have vanilla in it. Hmm. Um, which I don't know if you'd miss. I mean, that's one of those things where you automatically put vanilla in almost everything you bake. And do you... I mean, yes, there are some things where you would notice that you've got <laughs> vanilla in it. A lot of times you don't. But there's so many other flavors. There's so many other flavors. You just don't. So it's got a nice chocolatey flavor. It is moist. That... And that's where, you know, that chocolate liqueur would just... Oh, the chocolate Instead of vanilla yeah. would just... Yes. A chocolate liqueur. <laughs> you, you need a big scoop of icing. I thought I already did that taste test. Mm. I don't know, but I need to get in on that. Okay. Great cake. Incredible icing. I may do an old cookbook show where we do an incredible two ingredient, two minute chocolate fudge. Cause that's really good. Um, that's now my favorite chocolate icing. Really? Yeah. I don't know. That's a tough one. There's okay. some really good, good buttercreams out the there. Chocolate buttercreams are really uh -huh. good. That's, you know, and you... Okay, yeah. so this is, my, this is my new favorite summertime hot picnic chocolate icing. That's probably That's a good choice. That's not going to run. Because it's not going to melt. It's and... not going to melt and run off. Good so, call. thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.